What is laser? Laser is an acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. The laser is a sort of highly directional monochromatic coherent light. How does laser work? Before we start talking about lasers, let us see the difference between direct and indirect semiconductors. In direct vanguard semiconductors, the recombination process occurs without a change in electron momentum. The recombination process releases light as photons. In indirect Van Gaap semiconductors, a change in electron momentum is required for recombination to occur. This process releases heat as phonons. The difference between direct and indirect band is very important for laser devices which require direct semiconductor to generate photons. Before we start discussing the basics of lasing, we should talk a bit about the radiative transitions in solids. There are basically three processes for interaction between a photon and an electron. They are absorption, spontaneous emission, and stimulated emission. To demonstrate these processes, we will consider a band gap diagram of a semiconductor, where EC is the lowest energy level in the conduction band, and EV is the highest energy level in the valence band. And the energy difference between EC and EV is EG, which is the band gap energy. So let us start with optical absorption. An incident photon can excite a valence electron to go to the conduction band. Such a process generates electron hole pair. The energy of each photon is HV, where H is Planck constant and V is the photon's frequency. When the photon energy HV is smaller than the band gap energy EG, the photons are not absorbed and the light is transmitted through the material. The semiconductor in this case appears to be transparent. When the photon energy HV is almost equal to the band gap energy EG, the photon is absorbed and an electron from valence band is elevated to the conduction band. Thus, an electron hole pair is created. Moving on into the spontaneous emission, which is an independent event that occurs when electrons give up energy as they make transition from upper level to a lower level. This photon emission occurs in a random direction and yields a spectral output with a fairly wide bandwidth. In lasers, we are interested in stimulated emission. If we have an intense field of photons, each photon has the energy of HV equal to EG and is in phase with the other photons, conduction band electron will be induced to drop into valence band contributing a photon whose wave is in phase with the radiation field. If this process continues and other electrons are stimulated, a large radiation field can build up. In thermal equilibrium, and since EC is larger than EV, the electron concentration in EC will be less than the electron concentration in EV. Thus, absorption is more likely to occur than stimulated emission. To obtain more stimulated emission than absorption, the electron concentration in EC should be larger than it in EV. This term is called population inversion. It is the first important requirement for lasing action to occur. Another requirement is to enhance the stimulated emission over spontaneous emission. To do so, we need a very large photon field energy density. This is encouraged in laser devices by providing an optical resonant cavity, in which the photon density can build up to a large value through multiple internal reflection at certain frequencies. In short, to initiate a lasing action, we need a direct band gap semiconductor, we need also more stimulated emission than absorption by population inversion, and finally, we need a very large photon field energy density by having optical resonant cavity. And the question now is, what are the laser structures? The first PN junction laser is called homojunction laser. In homojunction laser, same semiconductor material is used on both sides of the junction. The internal surfaces of the PN junction are polished to be mirrors. Two sides are roughened to prevent lasing across the diode cavity. One side is cleaved to make it a highly reflective surface. The last side is also cleaved, but it's made as a partially reflective surface. Under appropriate biasing conditions, laser will be emitted from this side. Moving on into the energy band diagram of the PN junction at thermal equilibrium, 
P and N shall be highly dubbed, or as it's called, degenerately dubbed. In degenerate semiconductors, the Fermi level is below the valence band edge in the P side. And since we are at the thermal equilibrium, we will get the same Fermi level in the N side, but it is above the conduction band edge. In both P and N regions, the area below the Fermi level is full of electrons. If a forward bias VF is applied, the Fermi level of P will move down and the Fermi level of N will move up. The depletion region D will be narrower. Electrons are injected from the N region into the depletion region. Holes are injected from the P region into the depletion region too, where recombination occurs and current flows in the diodes. If the forward bias increased into a sufficient large voltage, high injection of electrons and holes into the depletion region occur. As a result, the region D has now a high electron concentration in EC, in the conduction band, whereas the region D has a high holes concentration in the valence band and consequently a low electron concentration in EV. Hence, NEC is larger than NEV and the condition of population inversion is satisfied. Photons are emitted by recombination in the depletion region which is called active region. Another popular type of laser is heterojunction. In heterojunction devices, we have a junction between two different semiconductors. The broad used heterojunction laser is the double heterojunction, which is called DH laser, in which a thin layer of a small band gap semiconductor is sandwiched between two larger band gap semiconductors. DH laser requires less current to obtain the population inversion and to start lasing in the active region. Moving on into recent technologies, we could talk about quantum well lasers, where the device dimensions became significantly tinier. The small size leads to quantization of the energy levels. The lowest quantized energy level in the conduction band is at a level above the band gap edge. Similarly, the highest quantized energy level in the valence band is at a level below the band gap edge. Thus, the energy of the emitted photons increases compared to the bulk material, consequently the wavelength decreases. By reducing the size of the active region, researchers achieved quantum wire lasers and quantum dot lasers. So let us ask, what makes laser light so unique? High monochromaticity, which also known as narrow spectral width. If we have a typical lamp whose light is directed into a spectrometer, we get a plot of intensity versus wavelength and we find that it has a certain width, delta lambda. If we did the same for a laser device, we will find that the width is extremely narrow and this means a radiation of a monochromatic wave. High collimated beam property can be explained as following. If we try to collimate the light beam of a typical source whose diameter is 2h and then to collect the light by a lens with a focal length of f, the angle of diversion theta would be given by h over f. However, if we have a laser source emitting a beam with a diameter of d, we will have an angle of diversion theta that is very small and is very close to lambda over d and that means we got a highly collimated laser beam. High power. The laser light can be either continuous or pulsed. The continuous laser power goes up to the range of megawatts, whereas the pulsed laser power can reach the range of exawatt, which is 10 to the power of 18. Wide tuning range means the laser has a broad range of electromagnetic spectrum. Laser wavelengths fall between the far infrared and the deep ultraviolet. Finally, lasers have a very short pulse width. It can go down to the range of femtosecond, which is 10 to the power of minus 15. Last but not least, we would like to mention some important parameters of lasers, such like normal working laser power and its maximum allowable power, as well as the peak power for pulsed operation. And as mentioned earlier, the wavelength of a laser is decided by the related stimulated energy transition. In addition, 
The focal spot size determines the maximum energy density that can be achieved when the laser beam power is set. And the depth of focus is the distance over which the focused beam has about the same intensity. Now let's talk about the laser from Islamic perspective. Allah says in Surah Al-Haqqah, فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِمَا تُبْصِرُونَ وَمَا لَا تُبْصِرُونَ We understand from this verse that Allah has mentioned long time ago that we do not see some particles and creatures. However, the verse does not deny the fact that we could be able to see some of them later on, and that's what happened. Scientists discover the range of the visible light which can be detected by the human eye. All other waves out of this range are not visible to our bare eyes. However, the invention of laser and its applications, such like laser microscopy, led to the discovery of many tiny particles. Laser also can detect fast phenomena that we were not able to catch. In addition, laser applications in astronomy help researchers to capture clearer images of distant galaxies. For different applications, different lasers with different band gaps are used. All parameters and properties should be chosen and used precisely. Allah says in Surah al kamar <laughs> Here, we should remember and think about the greatness of Allah who created everything precisely, especially when we study that the laser wavelength decreases and the photon energy increases when we use a larger band gap semiconductor.